I was born in Anaheim, in California, and I grew up in Houston, Texas. I did my grade school in Houston. I had four older siblings, and um, we, we pretty much all played music. I listened to what I was exposed from my parents, and um, some was from my parents. My mother loved classical music. Um, she used to take me to the opera young. I was, the, I was very lucky. I accompanied her. And um, they liked old school big bands. Um, I listened to a lot of um, pop music, whatever my, my siblings were. I think the first record I bought actually was Michael Jackson Off the Wall. Um, I started on piano, and then I started playing drum set and percussion um, as a teenager when I was 16. I started um, on piano when I was three, actually, yeah. Oh, and I sang in choirs. I almost forgot. I did sing in choirs through my grade school. I don't know if I decided that. I think it came more naturally as... as um, as I evolved as a musician, I, I studied music and I was always into performing, but I think I started writing in my, well, I started writing just when, in, in my education, I started writing early, but I don't think I started writing really for myself until my, maybe mid, late 20s. Yeah, when I was already performing. Um, it was really important for me to play a lot of music for, for my personal experience. I think it informed a lot for me to be able to play in ensembles and other people's music before I publicly also started to write and play my own music. Well, I played in a punk band <laughs> in, um, in high school, which was pretty funny because I played piano and organ in church too. <laughs> So I had this, these different sides. My family encouraged it. We were a musical family. Um, four out of five siblings all played instruments, all played piano, guitar, and sang. And then I also played um, Southeast Asian music, yeah, gong music. My family was from the Philippines in Manila, and I guess the first time I saw and heard a Kulin song was at my uncle's house. And my parents would host Philippine choirs when um, they would just come, you know, it was not like it was a big situation with pack the house and sit around the piano and I would hear that. Um, I also fell in love with jazz music as a teenager. Yeah, I think one of the first records I heard on the radio was um, Monk's Dream. Uh, that was a jazz record, and I said, what was that? And I went to um, one of my drum lessons and said, I want to hear, I want to hear some jazz. Yes, um, I think I was really blown away by the music that they were playing for string quartet. I didn't know that I didn't know that that existed actually. Yeah. I hadn't heard a string quartet play that this kind of repertoire the, the diverse repertoire that they played and when they talk about their musicality I just I feel it's amazing they're a string quartet. They're a band. You know, very much a band and that's very unique. I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, David and I had been having conversation about collaborating, and I suppose he had heard some of my my playing. And um, you know, it it's exciting, and it also was 
challenging, I think, to find these different um, instrumentations meeting, you know, that have come from different genres, you know, traditions of genres, and how to meet that. And, and then as we, as uh, we began to talk about this project and that it's an educational project, could we make a piece together that would be in some way a rhythmic study for string quartet? And he had expressed to me that he didn't think there was a piece in that manner, you know, also, which would ended up being incredibly challenging for me because it was also to make, you know, as great a piece as I can for them to play this in, in as part of their musical repertoire, but also that we could take it apart and look at it and have parts that, that we or anyone could study rhythmically. That, um, that interested me a lot. Well, I'd have to go back also to the uniqueness of Kronos, because I don't think I would have, I wrote it specifically with intention for, for them, and knowing that, um, having heard, heard them play so many pieces, and knowing that they can play like a band, and the challenge of bringing drum music <laughs> into a string quartet and what, but also giving them the freedom to uh, take it and translate it and make it their own. What I liked about this very much is that we had discussions, that David and I had discussions. And so that was really helpful to think and, and listen to what, what could be the possibility of it. Um, what was difficult is when we put in the idea of a study because something that's music for a concert or something that's music for study. Um, I have never done that before. This is a first, <laughs> you know, to combine that um, and to think about that early on when you're creating the work, you start to intellectualize the study of, oh, if I take this and extract this in, in a symbol chart, they can also for string quartets or string players that use this score afterwards, um, they can also practice how to play these lines and what they would, how they would develop it. But it's a strange thing to think about initially because I had never thought of creating a score in that way before. So it was a first for me to think about that. It just took me, yeah, it, <laughs> it took me for a loop for a moment. <laughs> So the title for the piece for Kronos is called Pulsation, and there are different rhythms and tempos where these melodies and parts are moving through, and I'm really interested because, well, one of the reasons I'm really interested and excited to hear Kronos play the piece is we all have different pulses and um, organically and our heartbeats and how we naturally and physically feel rhythm. So I'm very excited and curious to hear some of the rhythmic um, motifs, they, um, patterns and stuff, they are inspired from some traditional Philippine rhythms. And then also there's um, plays of rhythmic polyrhythms, basic structures that I always love to play, like I could play them forever. And there's so many different ways you could express that. So that's interesting to me, what will happen when they play these, when they improvise on it. And um, it's just those magical things, even if it's contemporary music, but we're using um, these structures that come out with, with rhythms that have been played for a very long time. Um, it just it holds true to being very deep when you hear it and resonate with with that. So I I was very interested to s to hear and and see how we might interact with these.
Well, Bo's a composer and performer, and I also, um, probably in the last decade, have been doing sound installation. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I like to very much to work with recording and field recording and, and thinking. I think it's something we think about as performers and composers also. It's another um, aspect and dimension of thinking about music and sound spatially and how we interact in our environments, whether it's with people or the natural environment. So I, I, um, I seem that seems to be something that I'm, Karen, that I'm drawn to, as particularly um, those those questions of how we are in our place in our environment, and that could be something that's more in a natural environment, um, or or socially or culturally. It's you know such an interesting climate right now, um, on so many levels, yeah. And even if we just shrunk it down to the climate of the arts, and what we're um, how we're evolving. And I had a discussion with a friend, and it was a terrific quote. It said that, um, the climate of the arts is changing, and it's uncomfortable because it actually is changing and we can feel it and maybe there's more awareness than we think. Sometimes we think there isn't, but perhaps there is more awareness of understanding what it is to be present uh, in, in, around people in our environment and how, um, what that means on so many levels of identity and um, how we interact with people. Yeah, people are, I think there's finally a change to talk about these things. Yeah. yeah, not that there haven't been changes, but it definitely is happening at the moment now, that uncomfortableness, you know, it, which is like a graceful word for so many things that are loaded and happening. Um, but that's also exciting. Right now I'm working with, um, a glaciologist and geomorphologist were doing a piece called An Acoustic Story on Climate Change. And we're mapping from source to sink in the Himalayan glaciers down into the Ganges. So I'm just sound recording still and I'm, um, it's brought me back to water. I did a piece with uh, Moroccan musicians and an architect and we were, she, the architect, she was mapping all the water routes of Fez. It seems to Water has been something that's continually coming up in conversation, and that whole importance and the culture around that. So recently I was field recording in, uh, down in the river part in Ganges in Varanasi, Varanares and Sarnath, two very spiritual towns, um, cities, one for Hinduism and one for Buddhism. And that was, I learned a lot about sonically what that culture around water sounds like, not just recording the actual water. But we're also hoping we can build out technology so that we can install up on one of the glaciers in uh, Satopranth uh, the right kind of technology so every day we could get sound data. They've never done this on glaciers. They've done seismic sound, but uh, Michelle, Copes, the um, scientist, she says there's a lot of hope for that to, to, for us to understand it. And that's one of the great things about uh, art, right? Is being able to bring people in to have an experience um, that they may not be able to relate to, but that it's really important. It is really our experiences and our collected experiences. So that's um, one piece that I'm working on. Dream big and to go for it um, and to listen to what's in their heart, follow their passion, yeah, and speak up, yeah. <laughs>